Hello everyone, uh, my name is Meena Vaidyanathan and I'm the co-founder of Knowledge Factory. On behalf of Niti Consulting, the Promise Foundation and our mentor Madhavan Narayanan, I welcome you all to this edition of KF Cafe. Uh, if you are sharing insights on social media today, please don't forget to use hashtag KF2021. Um, this is the seventh edition of Knowledge Factory, a platform that we started in 2017 to bring interesting conversationalists, inspiring people in various fields of life, art, sports, business, um, technology, uh, who will provoke us, you know, who will bring in interesting insights. And uh, we have this is the seventh such edition and uh, the second in the series of KF Cafe that we launched uh, in April 2021. Some of you may have uh, attended uh, the April 2021 KF Cafe that we presented, where we presented or uh, actor turned author Kabir Bedi. And today we are really happy and excited to present before you Imtiaz Aniz. Um, Olympic fever is at a feverish pitch, and we thought it was only appropriate that we invite, um, you know, uh, an Olympian uh, in, into our midst and have a conversation with him. Uh, the Olympic equestrian in Piazanese was born in India. He studied in Australia and currently lives in the United States. Uh, Impiaz has had the opportunity to train with some of the best riders in uh, Australia, France, England, New Zealand, Switzerland, and the United States. Um, and he definitely knows a thing or two about the equine world. But what really makes him really interesting is that, you know, while he's competed in international uh, games and platforms like the Sydney Olympics in 2000 and the Asian Games and won many, many uh, medals for India. In fact, he was the first Indian civilian uh, to compete and represent India uh, in the equestrian uh, you know, sport in the Asian games and also win a bronze. Uh, and he also represented India in 2000 uh, Olympics. But what really makes him interesting is that he says he lives by a motto which says discipline, determination and dedication. And we'd definitely like to know more on that and what we can imbibe from him. And in conversation with him today is Nidhi Razdan. Nidhi uh, is a familiar face for all of us on television. She's been an award-winning journalist who is now turned academician. Uh, she, after uh, being an executive editor uh, at NDTV and worked there for more than two decades, she is now the director for strategic programming and outreach at Geetham University. Uh, she's also visiting faculty at the newly set up Cotillia School for Public Policy, uh, which is also a part of Geetham. She's a recipient of a number of prestigious awards, uh, you know, uh, key among them being the Ramnath Goenkai Award for Excellence in Journalism for her reporting from Jammu and Kashmir and the International Press Institute India Award in 2019. Um, uh, many of you who have pre-registered can um, write in your questions on the platform. Um, all others can view on YouTube uh, on the link KF O N Y T, all in caps, uh, and subscribe to the Knowledge Factory channel. Um, over to Nidhi and Imtiaz, and don't forget to add hashtag KF2021 if you're sharing insights and comments on social media. Meena, thank you so very much for that lovely introduction. And it's really a, a privilege and wonderful to be able to have this conversation with Imtiaz Anis. I had uh, a chance to read his book, Riding Free, an Olympic Journey, which I can tell you is, is a genuinely inspiring story of the struggle, the success, the tears, the heartbreak, the joy, every kind of emotion that is involved to train for something um, as, as big as the Olympic Games. And, 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 and really, I think even if you're not someone who is aspiring to be a sports person, this is a book that's worth reading to just understand you know, life's journey and to take inspiration from it. So congratulations, Imtiaz, for, for putting this book out there. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me on this uh, platform. I really appreciate it. So Imtiaz, let me ask you the first cliched question that authors are often asked, which is, why did you write this book? 
Well, uh, Nidhi, I had a, a couple of things in mind. One of the main reasons that both I, I wrote the book was to actually reach a wider audience of people to tell them how to live their dream. You know, I mean, when you look, when you read the book, though it's an equestrian journey and though it's my journey, I want kids to get up, get out of this, and even parents and everyone to get stories out of it to say that you know, if you've got something and you're passionate about, you got to go for it. Uh, because I was a little boy, I was only six years old, and I had this dream always to represent India. I didn't even know which sport, so it's just something I really was very passionate about. And I thought the best way, if I write a book, I'll reach more people to make them and push them to get out of their comfort zone. So, what is your earliest memory of actually getting onto a horse? When did this begin for you? I was about five years old, I think, you know, and I still remember it because of the horse. Uh, that brings back the memories. I can never forget him. I was only four or five years old and I was introduced to horses and my grandfather had this, you know, big strapping horse at that time. You know, now he's not a very big, he wouldn't have been a big horse, but I was so little. So he looked like a giant to me. And he was, a, you know, he was a white horse and he had just long mane and he was strong. And I, all my, every day I would beg them for me to ride him, you know, but they said, no, no, he's too strong. He's, he'll run away with you. He'll throw you off. And he did. He actually threw my grandfather off. He threw my mother off. He threw my sister off everybody in the family so they said well, no we cannot put you on him but i used to spend hours in the stable with him just getting to know him talk to him you know uh, tell him about my school and tell him how much i hated uh, all my sub the subjects that i hated and he, he became like a friend and the day i was actually allowed to ride him it was i i will know I, I still have goosebumps in uh, you know when talking about it because it was, it was a very special day so when did you actually begin training with him for competitions when did when did that start my first, oh, when I was five years old, I won my first competition with him when I was six. So I was only six years old, and we didn't even have a six year old category. I was still com com competing on under 12 or under 14, I think I was, you know, because there was no category for some, because there were no kids at that age that were actually competing. But we were like one. And you know, maybe what the amazing part was, it was not about competing, you know, it was just the fact that I could do something with him. To me, I had one. You know, the fact that it was just me and his name was Rajesh, you know, and I would always say, just me and Rajesh, what else do I need? I mean, you know, it was the one time that I felt so liberated because, you know, when you're a kid, you always have so many rules and regulations. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, do your homework, you know, make your bed, eat your vegetables. It was always instructions for every kid when you're that age. But when I sat on Rajesh, I had none. It was just me and him. So I just absolutely loved that time. How important was the fact that your family was so supportive of you doing this? Because that obviously made all the difference, didn't it? Absolutely. I mean, to me, that was everything. The whole book, actually, I mean, as you say, I'm dedicated to a few people. And the people I dedicated were like, of course, my parents and with immediate family, but then people who became my family. Because without a support team, you cannot achieve these goals. And today, it could be a question which people say, oh, my God, it was difficult because there's a horse involved. But in any sport, even if you look at athletics or if you look at, uh, or even in things in life, you, whatever you want to do, you need parental support to another level. You know, it's, you cannot have negativity around you. Don't do this. You know, it's too expensive. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough money. We don't have, you know, there are always excuses uh, that family can make. So I was very fortunate. I never had that in anything I wanted to do. If I ever came up with a suggestion, my parents would first say, let's do it. Then we would decide how we're going to do it. We didn't even know how we we're going to do it. But there was never a no. It was always a yes first. Then we made the plan. Now, uh, how old were you when you went to boarding school? Because you went to Sanaa and you were there for several years. And when you were at Sanaa, you obviously couldn't be riding horses, right? So what was that like to be away from your beloved horses and not to be you know, able to train with them? How old were you firstly when you, when you went to boarding school? So when I went, when, when I went to Sanaa, I was uh, 11 years old. I think 11 or 12, 11 years old. So I was really young and, you know, I was a little spoiled boy from Bombay City. You know, I, I lived at home and I was, I, I, I met, so it was really hard on two aspects. One, I, I really missed home. I missed my parents terribly. And then I missed Rajesh so much. You know, we used to have these, you know, our dorms, we used to have 20 beds in the dorm and everybody had a bed and a desk, a bed and a desk. And everybody had their family pictures on that desk. You know, I had all Rajesh's picture there. You know, even my friends today said, you know, you had Rajesh's picture. We had mom and dad, you had your horses because I missed him so much. It was very hard. But the holidays, we got long holidays when we were in boarding school and I rode morning and evening. In fact, uh, one of the stories even in the book is like we used to take the train and when, it, when the train came and my parents came to pick me up, the train would get into Bombay at about 5.30 in the morning and I wouldn't even go home. They would bring my riding clothes. I would change in the car and go first thing would be to go and see Rajesh, you know. Uh, so it was tough. It was not easy. But, you know, they knew it was the best thing for me. Again, parents knowing what's right for you. I mean, at that point, they could have easily pulled me out because I was unhappy 
they were unhappy. So there were a lot of things that could happen, you know. But it was just uh, amazing that they said, no, this is what's going to make a man out of him. We got to stick with it. In fact, authoritative sources have told me, Imtiaz, that uh, you know you would all count down to to those holidays from school, from boarding school, and everybody would have like a calendar on which they would you know write what they were looking yes. forward to doing. Yes. And those authoritative sources say that the only two things you wrote on yours was Rajesh and Arizona. So Arizona, <laughs> I presume, is another horse, and you've written yes, about yes, Arizona. Yes. Too. Yes, yes. I, I I need to check your 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 resources. Uh, been quite strong and, and and very correct. We should have it in the calendar. Even till today, it's like now forty years. I still remember. It's called DLTGH. Days left to go home. For me, That's it was right. not days left to go home. Mine was more days left to see my horses. You know, to to to, to see horses. And it was always about how how soon am I going to see Rajesh in Arizona. So when did that passion for riding actually transform into a goal to compete at the highest level, which is the Olympic Games? When did that transition happen for you? That also happened when I was about 11 or 12, because I was very fortunate and I was extremely, extremely blessed that I had a coach and a mentor come into my life at that age. So there was a lady called Diana Wilson, whose husband was posted in India. So she was an expat and she had ridden at the highest level, very accomplished horsewoman, extremely well traveled, extremely well read. So someone you really look up to. And when she came, you know, from the countryside of, 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 of England to uh, Bombay City, you can imagine what a shock it was for her. She didn't know what hit her. And my family really, uh, you know, took her under wing because her husband traveled all the time. He was in charge of Asia. So she really became an extended family to us. And she started training me when I was 11 years old. And actually, uh, while meeting her and talking to her, I felt that, you know, when I grow up, I want to become like Diana. You know, I want to be an international rider. And so it was those things that really, and the time I spent with her. And what was amazing is that from 11, she took me all the way to the Olympic Games. So for 20 years, I trained with the same person without any hiccups, without any misunderstandings. It was just pure dedication. And there was no money exchange. That was the most amazing part. She did it from the goodness wow. of her heart. And it was really very, very special. It was quite a... Uh, you know, a bit of a fairy tale. So, what does it take to train, um, you know, for a sport like this in terms of the physical effort, the nutritional effort? And, you know, it's not just you who's training, it's also your horse. So, what is the kind of effort that, that that's needed? No, it's a lot. It's, it's, I mean, I can't even explain to you the amount what we have to go through because we have an animal involved. So most people, you know, they only train themselves. So they look after their own nutrition. They look after their own fitness. They look after their own, you know, uh, mental health. We have a horse as well that we have to look after. So, and a lot of time has to be spent with the animals. So it's really quite technical uh, with the way the sport has got as well. You know, we got to look at the aerobic, anaerobic training. We got to look at, see their lactic acid buildup. We got to see their nutrition, when to feed them, when not to feed them. And and it's really hard training because our sport is quite dangerous also. You know, the, most people don't realize it, but the cross-country phase, which is never really televised. So it's really only you get to see the dressage or you get to see the show jumping. But we also have a cross-country part of it where we're jumping four to five kilometers, which is a long distance at very, very fast speeds. And we're jumping 20 to 30 fences, uphill, downhill, ditches, banks. And the horse has never seen the course. So, you know, it's all on trust and training of keeping them so fit. So it's, uh, you know, but that's what I suppose, that's what the Dridden Rush is. That's why we do what we do. You know, if it was easy, everybody would do it. So, you know, how, how do you sort of look at the fact that, you know, riding has traditionally been seen as a very elite sport as far as India is concerned or something that only the army did. So you were the first civilian to actually represent India in riding at the Olympics back in, in 2000. Is that still the case or do you think it's opening up to more people now? At this no, time. I definitely think it's opening up because in those days we didn't even have competitions. All competitions were held by the in army cantonment area, so it was good. It was not very accessible. Now the competition held with the, in civilian centers, riding clubs in in places like Pune, in Bangalore, in uh, Jaipur, Bhopal, Chandigarh. So it has grown. When I used to be competing twenty years ago, I was the only civilian. Now we have five hundred to a thousand at every event. So it is gradually growing and I think we'll see more and more because of the attachment with the horse. It's just a wonderful sport to get children involved in. Also, it goes into a market which is very rare, is that you don't have to be very sporty. You know, with any other sport, you've got to be the fastest runner or you've got to be kicking the ball the hardest. You know, so you've got to have strength. This is all about finesse. It's all about tact. It's about your bond with your horse. So even a non-sporty person can still do this and, and get a lot of confidence in it. 
tell, tell, tell me more about that. That's very interesting. It's about the bonding with your horse. What does that mean? Uh, it, you know, in every other sport, it's, you know, it's just about just how fast you can run. You know, so you keep running faster and faster and faster. This isn't like that. This is a bit like gymnastics combined with music. You know, so in music, like you, it's not like you can. You know, you just have to have that feeling. You gotta, you gotta hear the note and then play it. You know, there has to be some. So same thing with us when we're riding our horses. It's not about just going faster or using more leg or you know jumping higher, but it's about that understanding. Every stride you must feel that horse you must know how much he's got how much can he give so that sort of a bond only happens over time that's why even another thing about our sport which is i i, I love it is that you only start at 30 like all most olympians have finished their career by 25 if you're an athletic so if you're in any other sport because there's so much you know but ours there's so much experience that's required that at 30 is when you actually your career begins so you and you can carry on till 40. in fact at this sydney olympics uh, we had andrew hoy who's been to eight olympic games and he's 62 wow. years old and he was and he won two medals he won a silver and a bronze at 62. so it's just unbelievable the amount of uh, experience that you're going to have and that bond with animals that makes us sport very very special tell us a bit more about the bond with with the horses because you've written about that so vividly and so lovingly in the book that's such an important and integral part of who you are and it's not just about your sport how how did that change you each horse was different Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's it's. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad it came out in the in the story because when I was writing the story, people, you know, it's the horses that I thought about, and then the stories came around them because I never forget the yeah. each and every horse. In fact, I have my own. Uh, I'm now back in India after so many years, and I've started my own uh, equestrian training place and hope to train riders and hopefully, you know, spread the word of what what this equestrian world is about. And every stable, I have a brass plaque on all the horses that matter to me. So it was, it, it, they mean so much to me, you know, like even every stable from Rajesh to Arizona to my first Asian game horse or my first international horse, every single horse I remember. And it's that special relationship you have with each one of them. Each one is different. Each one, and you know, it's not like a dog where you, uh, because I know you're a dog lover, so I want to <laughs> explain it to you that yeah. because in a dog, when you come home, you know, they wag their tail and they come and jump on your lap and you know, they and, and you and you feel that bond. And horses, I, I, I hope I hope my horses don't come and jump on my lap because uh, that won't be very good. <laughs> that was the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little, you know, that, you know, when you have a, uh, that perfect relationship where you don't have to speak, but everything is said. That's what it is with the horses. You know, the, you just have to spend time with them, be in their stable, whether it's grooming them, whether it's giving them a bay, a bath, whether it's taking them for a walk, whether it's, you know, taking them for a swim, or you even just hand grazing them. It's that bond that as you spend more time with them, it's an under, it's a mutual understanding that you have between them. And each one is different. Each one has a little different character. Each one likes a certain things. Each one don't like certain things. And you got to get to know that. And to me, that's what makes it even more special. It's that journey. Competing, you're at, you know, it, anything can happen, right? You can win, you can lose, you can fall off. That's the sport. But you always come home with a smile because you know you did it with your best friend. Yeah, that's 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 a really lovely way to put it. Tell me, Imtiaz, you know, uh, you you've actually struck a very optimistic and positive tone throughout the book as you've described your journey. But you know, you face setbacks as well, like when you uh, were dropped at the last minute from the 94 Asian Games. How did you deal with that? That was a big setback for you personally. Absolutely. And also my very first setback. So it was like a first real, uh, you know, uh, like I would say in the Hindi, jatka to the system, you know, like, oh my God, what, the, what just happened? And, you know, it was hard because I was only 19 years old. I was trying to do something that nobody has done ever in India, being the first civilian. You know, I was trying to get out of the normal, you know, uh, get really pushed every limit. Even the, all the trials that were held, they have held them in difficult, difficult places from Jalandhar to Jaipur to uh, Delhi to, you know, even in Bihar. And I was traveling in a truck all by myself, you know, with my horse. In those days, we didn't even have cell phones. My parents didn't even know where I was. And, you know, I would get to a dhaba and use that one rupee coin to call them just to tell them I'm alive, literally. So, you know, lots went into it. And then to be actually selected, to actually go overseas and actually got training with, with the Indian team. I wore the Indian blazer. I was so proud. I was so excited. You know, my friends, my family, my son, everybody. And then to know the next day that you're not on the team. You know, it just crushed you, crushed you. And it took me a little while, I have to be honest. I like to say that, no, I just bounced back immediately. No, I did. I couldn't get out of bed. Because uh, it just, you know, it does. But again, I come back to the, the support. 
my parents were there they were all quiet there was no wise you know you know this should have happened that could have happened you should have done this no 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 nothing of that was done what was done was done there's nothing we could have done about it and all they said was what do you want and my answer was to represent india and they said well then get back on the saddle that's all you have to do you just find another way to do it you know so that's the kind of support i had my parents because they could have also said you know you actually have made it you've done all of all the qualifyings you got selected you're wearing the india india blazer you just didn't get to ride but everything else you had so you know let's move on to something else maybe this is not meant for us but they didn't say that they said no no this is if this is what you want you have to complete your goal stick with yeah. it that's the most important yeah. thing which i want to tell parents also whatever these kids go through you know they, i have kids you know when they have a bad teacher or you know they have not you know oh well it didn't work that well or they didn't have some wins it's okay that's what life is all about you do not quit you know like in sanam we have the motto and i live through it you know is never give in you just don't give in you just keep uh, fighting and uh, find different ways that's one thing i tell you, you learn from your mistakes also you don't carry on with the same path you know you got to learn from something else move from somewhere else make your adjustments but keep climbing the ladder one of the things though uh, about riding in india at the moment is that you still need to go abroad to get the best training is isn't that true especially if you want to be competitive uh, do you see that changing because it 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 means that it's a much more expensive sport to invest in for 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 people than other sports isn't it so you know i think to learn to ride to get to a good level you can do it in india now we've got some good coaches and with some good people good riding schools and centers all over india unfortunately with our sport in order to qualify for any of these big games like the olympic games or world championships you have to go overseas because there's no qualifying event in india so that's one thing that if that changes that will change our sport a lot so that is a lot of sacrifice you're going to do like most of the sports people uh nidhi they just go for competition exposure for competition experience or or you know just fine tuning and get coaching we have to go 3 4 years before to qualify to base ourselves so there's a lot of sacrifice that goes through from the family from your from yourself you you know you leave your friends uh, you leave everything that you you know your comfort zone and you got to go into this environment and push yourself so it's not easy i mean in the book there were lots of times i was extremely uh, lonely you know it's a quite a lonely path and i want to tell people it's okay to be it, it is fine you know it's it's not that you have to always have so many people around you and people around you supporting you because at times i would be sitting there all by myself and saying oh, i wish i was just home with back home with mom and dad but then I, i won't have been able to do what i wanted to do you know but what is the kind of support that you'd like to see uh, imtiaz both from the government and uh, even from private uh, from the private sector from industry maybe to to give this sport the kind of support that it really needs in the country you know nidhi i'm a very firm believer that it's not about equestrian sport any sport we have to get the business houses involved in it you know except for cricket where it's all about the coverage and what they're getting in return no other sport really gets looked into i mean when you look at pure sports like even like now the hockey team or you look at the uh, you know other wrestlers i mean look at what they go- they've gone through to achieve this medal for the country only after they win everybody comes and says you know we'll give you this and we'll give you that and corporates come in and there's a you know they they get into a few ads and things like that but what about the four years that it took them to get to that that's where they need the help that's where they need the support and if we really get that sporting culture into this country we've got the talent and we have got the, the work ethic everything it's just that they don't have that support and everybody points towards the government at all times i i do believe that the government have has a role to play but i think as a citizen of india you also have a role to play because these people are actually flying your flag high you know so and and even for businesses to have sports people in the business is is the way to go even for their own businesses because it teaches you resilience it teaches you punctuality it teaches you teamwork it teaches you how to never give in it teaches you to work with different types of people you know there's so much you can get out of sport i really believe that i hope through this book that's what i want to spread the sport is not just to go down to your playground and play even in schools it's an extracurricular activity it shouldn't be it should be a part of a sporting activity if they actually train hard work hard towards a goal not just play around and then have one athletics meal like even most schools have athletics day it's one day it's i mean no school above sees as one day yeah. that that's the athletics day they have one day they run all the runs so the person who's running the 100 meters running the 200 and the 400 on that same day what sort of performance is he going to give average so we are actually setting him them up to be average because i guess like you said you see it as an extracurricular activity and not something that's part of a culture 
like the way we look at academics or you know absolutely but what's the response been like to your own riding school that you have now um uh, in gujarat uh, you 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 come back to india you've just set this up do you find that there is a lot of interest in 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 this sport now huge and you know what's amazing the amount of people that are coming from different parts of india i've got boys and girls coming from chandigarh delhi orissa pune all over the country people realize this is the place that now we can actually learn and it's not only about a riding lesson that's what i want to be different because there's a horse involved so most riding schools in india which used to be i mean they're the old fashioned way where you go there have your riding lesson and you go home for me that's not what riding our sport is about it's about how you look after that animal how do you feed it how do you bathe it how do you get maximum you know get to know your horses and there's so much more that i can teach these uh, students and it's a live in accommodation so some some kids come for a week some pe- kids come for two and three months because that's wow. where the real difference between coaching and mentoring takes place coaching is when they're riding a horse that's when i coach them when they're off the horse i mentor them and that's what diana was for me so i was very fortunate at the age of 11 i had diana who would coach and mentor me because we would coach every morning at the race course then we would come home because she would not go back to her her house because her husband was usually traveling and she you know didn't know anybody else so she would come home and that's when the mentoring happened so we talked about different things different you know got to know me i got to know her and that's the bond that uh, you know makes then she's able to push you to different uh, level what's the toll though that all of this takes on the family because you you've described in the book and and even now how supportive of course they've been and you know they got you back into the saddle when 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 you were down but it must have been very difficult on your family to be away from you uh, for long periods and yes. you know to it, you know, it was a lot of well <laughs> So yeah I think it's you know it's hard and that you know its parents have to understand that that you have to allow your children to live their dreams even though my parents would have loved for me to be at home and you know be be every part of it but they knew how important it was uh, you know wherever they could come to the competition they always made it so that was also special you know my dad worked in a uh, he was uh, an executive in a company and was extremely busy and when I was a, I I still remember like I was a swimmer and I used to swim for school or swim for co- I I swam for college you know he would still when I was on that block I just had to look up and he was there. He may have just come for my race and left, but he made sure that he was always there. They have never missed in any event where they could have come. They were always there. There was never an excuse or there was never something and they they moved their schedule around to as much as possible, but at least one of them was always there. And it's not sometimes they don't have to be uh uh you know saying anything or doing anything. Just the fact that they're there just means a lot. So you know coming back I know I got a bit uh away from that uh, your question of actually what they go through it is tough it is not easy at all but they have to look at the big picture they have to look at what they are actually doing for their child you know sometimes we see uh, uh, we molly call them too much we protect them too much we always there to you know every step you know something happens we're there to to hold their hand no it's okay let them have a little fall it's you're still the, the net is still there so if if they make their mistakes with you still there they're still going to go higher rather than not allow them to make a single mistake because when it happens then then they can't recover from it any uh, specific injuries anecdotes from your own experience riding all your life Anything of course uh, uh, you know one it's one it's in the book so i'm giving you snippets of the book i hope people yeah. can write read the book to get the whole you know but i was at at one an asian game trial and i was in jalandhar and a horse you know kicked me in the face and i and i dislocated my nose you know and it was horrible horrible i was all alone i was just I'm like there was no and you know to just at, at that time you know even how old you are it doesn't really matter the first thing you think i wish my parents were here you know sometimes you just want to hug and you just want to be there with them and i know but i was just standing out there like you know with this in so much pain and but again my mind was how can i get back and ride the next day you know am i going to be there for that trial i had to actually miss a trial so it was not easy not easy at all and then coming back to you know uh, bombay and then my parents were there and my grandmother and everybody you know uh, worried about you know whether i was going to be but again you know my parents you know full support this as soon as i felt better they said Go take back. the train and get back to delhi and you know keep going <laughs> ouch i can't even imagine what that was like you know there are uh, there are some people who have actually written in with questions uh, okay. for you mcrs those who are easy ones <laughs> uh, they're not bad at all um i like this question this is from resham chabra who's asking what do indian athletes lack in order to win more olympic medals i do want to rephrase that slightly to say i think it's mm-hmm. great that you know we've actually got uh, you know the medals that we have and come close to getting others but 
how do we realize our full potential? I think, as I said earlier, we have to start young. We have to start them at schools and college. It cannot be an extracurricular activity. We must give them, and other sports have to be given the same amount of time, effort, and money as we're giving cricket. If we just do that, we will be there. The culture has to change. Just like we are an absolute fanatically crazy country about cricket. We should be about that for every sport. All these uh, sports people are working so hard and so many sacrifices that are made by them and their families, those stories need to come out. And not just before the Olympic Games. It has to be carried through into schools, into colleges. People have, need to be, talks have to be going on about them so that people understand what it actually takes for these people to be what they are. And I think that will change the name and game for our, for our country. In fact, I think many of them are where they are despite the system and not because of it. And that's really well, absolutely. I mean, they're just, I mean, you look at the stories. I mean, like today also in the news, they was talking about the, you know, Mirabai who won the silver medal uh, for weightlifting, how she, you know, had to take a truck. You know, truckers took her from her from her village to her to where she was practicing every day. And today she actually had food for all of them. You know, she said this was her thank you to give back to. So she didn't even have transport to get to her, from her home to her venue. So this is where we need. To, this is what needs to change uh, now, not one year before the Olympic Games. As soon as these Olympic Games get over, we need to be focusing on the next Olympic Games. Okay. Um, another question here is: uh, Does one need to own a horse in order to get into equestrian sport? This is from Heyman Gall. Heyman, not at all. There are lots of riding school. In fact, I would advise not to own a horse right now because you need to get used to it. They need to understand whether first they like it or don't like it. There's a lot in ownership of a horse. And there are lots of riding schools all over India, which actually you can go. It's like renting a renting a horse, you know, so you can get to there. You can lease a horse. You can even ride the riding school horses. So absolutely not to ride to it, at least a good level. You don't have to own your horse or own horse at all. Another sort of related question in that sense, how much do parents need to budget in order to have their child get into uh, in, into riding? That's from uh, Ratnanjali Singh. I don't believe in budgeting at all. I never did that. You read my book. It's all about the power of, you know, the, the, and the passion. If you really want something, if there's a will, there's a way. Even in my riding school, I have kids who can't afford it, but they're willing to work. They're willing to do some, you know, there's something in exchange. You know, they can look after horses, they can ride horses, they can go and work at a, at a stable. They're, even overseas, working student programs are huge. You know, we, I went as a working student. I used to went to a stable where I worked because I wanted to train with the best riders. I couldn't afford those lessons. They were ridiculously expensive. But I should clean eight to nine stables. I slept in the stable just so that I could get lessons from the world champion because I knew if I wanted to be anybody, I have to learn from the best. But that's the type of dedication that you have to put in. So I don't look at money as such as, you know, of course, if you have the money, why not? But you can also do it on without the money, You can, but you have to work harder. Have you stopped competing? Completely. Competing, I have stopped, but I love riding. So that's something that gives me the maximum uh, pleasure even now. So even every morning, I still ride horses. I still train horses. I've got clients who send me horses to, to school or to get riding. So I still, you know, somebody asked me, how's it been from being an athlete to a coach? And I said, luckily for me, it hasn't been too much because I still get to ride. Most other, uh, you know, athletes, like if you're a swimmer, once you finish and you get older, you don't, you know, you're not swimming to that competitive level. I can still ride to a decent, uh, you know, to a competitive level. So I just love that I can still ride. What does your mentor think about your transition from athlete to coach? She's she's she she loves it. She said that I, she said now you know what I went through. <laughs> you know, Has she seen you coach not. anyone? Has she seen you? Would that be would that intimidate you? If no, you had no, to not at all. No, she, no, I, I, I'm always one of those. I, I really believe that it's. Uh, the, you know, you gotta have to be an open book. Even with me, when I when I'm teaching students, I have my other students always watch me teach. We discuss what the good, what the bad, because it's a conversation. It's not about this is the way to do it. You know, that school has changed. One plus one is two. Then you have to learn it that way. You know, the systems has changed. Uh, you you know, coaching has to be changed. You gotta understand each student. You gotta know how much to push each student. I've got students that were competing in Australia at national level, and one parent told me he said, you know, you warmed up somebody, and then the, the, another girl was in the same class, and you gave a totally different warm up. I said, yeah, because they're totally different girls. One I, I could push, but one I could not push. I'll get the same result because you got to look at their mental state. You know, you got to look at their horse. You got to see how much how much you can push each person. So that's what I love about it because each one is different. You know, it's not like a, a factory. That's what makes it even more special because animals, every animal is different. You know, when I ride uh, one horse, I ride another horse. I have to ride it totally different. 
So that's what makes it a bit more interesting. You have a young son. Does he like riding as well? He does like riding. He rides because dad rides. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, and I love it that he rides. But again, I don't push him to do something that is not his passion. His passion is tennis and, and football. That's what he loves to do. And I would support him doing that. So that's, again, I think it's important to tell parents that you can't let them live your dream. You know, my dream, of course, would be for him to be in a question uh, rider. But no, he, that's not what his calling is. He still he loves to ride and he'll ride with me once in a while, you know, just for fun. And, uh, and he enjoys it. But what he's really passionate about is football. So then we, we uh, you know, I make it possible for him to, to do that sport. I like this question. Uh, Amani has a, uh, wants to know why you waited 20 years to write the book. Oh. <laughs> well, I think uh, it's just part. I, I, well, I suppose the pandemic happened. You know, I'm a very busy person. I love to do two, 200 things at a time. So I don't think I had the time to just sit down to write a book. Uh, even uh, this morning, like I've got up in the morning, I've ridden horses, I've trained uh, students, uh, you know, and I've rushed back and I, I've got to make this, into, uh, you know, this time with the Knowledge Factory, then I'm going to go back again to the stable. So, you know, I've always liked to juggle three, four things at the same time. So for me to actually sit down and say, I'm going to write a book, uh, you know, I just thought I wouldn't be able to get, you know, have that patience. It always forced you, actually. Yes, yes, it did. So you look at the positive. The positive of COVID was to uh, two positive. I had lots of positives actually at the, at, at, during uh, the pandemic. One was to write the book and also to come back to India and start the Equestrian Center. That's interesting because that's a big life, uh, sort of a life changing step that you took because you've been what away from India for what twenty five years. Uh, yes. Moving back is, a, is is quite a big step. And uh, why why did you decide to do that at this time? I was based in Australia and uh, I was managing an all girls private boarding school, which equestrian was the largest program. So we had 100 horses and 150 girls that rode competitively. I ran the whole program for the school and I actually took the school international, the kids international for the very first time. And I loved it. It was very, very fast paced. But then because of the pandemic, I knew I knew that Australia has very strict uh, quarantine rules. And I, so I thought, you know, my family was in India and I thought it's the time to come back and be close to them. And uh, then when I was here, I decided that, you know, might as well stay on. And uh, the rest is history. The rest is history. Uh, this is a good question. Julia Joseph is asking, how is how do you look at the attitude of parents uh, now in 2021 towards sports when uh, versus how it was, say, 20 years ago? I think the attitude has changed, for sure. In those days, it was very rare, very rare. Now, even in my school, I see parents getting more involved. They're pushing their children. You know, it's all right because I suppose maybe it's, it is online, but they're happy for them to be at my, my center and still... Uh, uh, you know, work, work, do school, but but sport is important to them. And the support system, like they're really supporting their kids with the time, time management, helping them achieve it, you know, whether they're driving them all the way to, to my place or driving them to tuitions or driving them to the sports uh, grounds. So I think it has changed a lot. I think parents have also realized how important sport is for their mental health. You know, it's not only physical. That's what I love about yeah. our sport. It's also mental health. And you need to do that for our kids. How do you think, though, that we can get uh, people's interest away from just cricket. I mean, it's easy to say that you have to give attention to boxing or tennis or weightlifting. And we only get excited when somebody wins a medal for the country. But do you see a kind of a roadmap on how that can actually be done? How do you get people interested? I because it's just an obsession and a passion. Yeah. But I think it's lack of knowledge. That's the main thing. I think people don't even realize, like even with my sport, it's three-day eventing. Most people don't even know what the sport is. There is yeah. zero exposure. Even, I, I mean, I hate to say it even today, but we had an Olympian that, uh, you know, another equestrian Olympian after 21 years, Fouad Mirza, and he even, you know, did an extremely good day one. And he, he, even the highlights, he wasn't even mentioned. So, you know, when, the, when we cannot even mention our athletes, uh, it's only focused on those that can win medals. So either it's cricket or those can win medals. But there's so many other sports. And until we give the same weightage to all these sports, only then we're going to see somebody excel in them. Because people have no knowledge about these sports, how they can access them, where, they, how it's, you know, unless they already have some sort of a, a link. So I think it's only a matter of time, but it's something that everybody is, uh, you know, it's just there. It's a matter of just getting that push now over for people to understand that their sport is much bigger than just cricket. Sport is just, is much bigger than just playing a game, you know. There's so much more that this, that sport can do for your children and for, 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 for all of us. 
I think the media there does have to take some share of the blame, and and I say that very honestly because it's clear that you know when you when you get out of the sort of uh, national capital and the, wherever the media is basically, and you go into small town India and you see that there is actually a lot of interest in other sports. It's just that we don't uh, highlight it the way we do cricket, and that's that's a sad fact. You mentioned Fawad Mirza. Actually, I was going to ask you about what you thought of how he's done. Uh, you know, seeing him qualify he's for the game—that's really terrific. Yeah, and uh, amazing, really wonderful. You know, he's a young boy. He's done exactly what I did 20 years ago. You know, he left India four years ago. He based himself in Germany. He's worked really hard. He's got he's got qualified, and he had a fantastic uh, uh, result as well. So it you know it's just wonderful for our sport that now you know people if 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 he hadn't been there, if people said, well, it was you know Imtiaz did one as one off. But now they know it can be done. So we're going to see more and more because you know these sort of things help and motivate the other riders to say, well, if one person can do it, now there's a second. So there there could be a chance for us to do it as well. So I'm I'm really excited for the sport in India. Uh, Amit Prabhu has a question. What is the time commitment that you made every day in order to make it to the Olympics? So, like, how long were you training every day? Uh, Amit, there's in in our horse world, it's the it's twenty four seven. Literally, you even when you're off the field, we gotta look after our horses. So the amount of time that we have to put into, even till today, I'm spend more time in the stables than my house. Uh, in fact, my wife always says, and yet again, you're going back to the stables. <laughs> you know, you're there in the morning, you're there in the afternoon, you're there in the evenings, you're there at night. Check again to check how you know is, is there enough bedding, is there enough water, do they have enough hay? You know, is the light all right? Is the mosquito repellent working? You know, it's just constant. It, you gotta live it. You gotta but breathe like, it. You had to divide your day because you had to study also, right? You had your homework yes, and you had school yes, and you know of course when you were in school you were in boarding school but how did you how do how was the sort of day compartmentalized well i would say you don't i mean for any sportsman they don't cut cup uh compartmentalize too much because you know everything just changes every day but for me i think it's between at least four four hours a day would be dedicated purely to horses ah. full focus so if you had to put That's a block a well, two hours yeah minimum minimum i would say then you have to find time for your studies, and you know, you know, you're burning the candle on both sides. I mean, you got to stay up really late, or you got to get up early. I mean, you couldn't really get up really early morning because that was really always riding time because the horses always worked uh, the first thing in the morning. So usually it was late nighters or mid, you know, uh, uh, to study and to catch up on schoolwork and hope that friends will help you with the uh, uh, with the notes and things like that because you miss. As you can see, I had lots of friends who helped me a lot. But you know, that's what it, so it takes. It takes an army for one person to reach this Olympics. So that's what's uh, you know quite uh, amazing. It's not you on your own. Even though I compete in individual sport, uh, if it wasn't for my friends, if it wasn't for my family, if it wasn't for all the mentors, if it wasn't for all the people that actually came into my life, I could have never achieved my goal. Were you a good student? Uh, see, I think you, like, you, you, you might have to ask your resources again there. <laughs> no, I wasn't <laughs> a very good student. I had, to, I had to work quite hard. I had to work quite hard. So your mind was always on the on the horses. Always, you know, they were thinking about same. girls. You were thinking about horses. Always, always. And the funny part that just that was very true. And the funny part was even for me, any story that we had to do, like in school, you know, English lit or English language, horses always came into the stories. If my teacher says you will write a story with no horse involved in it, I'm like, I, I don't know your story. Know. <laughs> he said, make sure there's not even not no four-legged animal will be in this story. <laughs> Somewhere or the other, I would bring Rajesh or Arizona in that story. But whatever the topic was, in Rajesh and Arizona I had to come into the into into that story. Cool names, I have to say, uh, for the yeah. horses. Uh, Meena Vedinathan actually has has a very good question. What can we do to support and improve a neighborhood sporting infrastructure, both physical? As, as well as resources, because that is what will help build a sporting culture. So what are the little things we can all do? So I think what we can all, as, as, as each individual, it's about if, you, if you've got a small community, like I'll give an example, just for a, for a start. Uh, I think that's easier than actually saying what it is. We had the pandemic on. I lived with my parents at that time because uh, uh, they were much older and I thought, you know, I need to be there to help them. And I, we live in a high rise building. And I was just thinking, I could not bear being in the in, in my apartment. So I actually sent a WhatsApp message to the whole building to say every morning at six o'clock, we'll, I'll do football training for the whole, all the building kids. And all the yeah. kids came down. 
So every morning, so that's the initiative that everybody can do. Everybody's good at something. You know, pass the message around and spread it because everybody has the time right now. You know, so this was perfect. So every morning they would come down. I made groups. I made batches, and we would do run. We would run laps around our building because we couldn't leave the building, and the playground was also sealed off, so we could just stay our, uh, in there so with nobody else was allowed. And we would do football drills. We do goals. We scoring. We would do exercises. And it was wonderful because it got the kids out, it got them doing something physical, it got them exercise. And then but the parents love you for getting the kids they out. Me. Absolutely, they thought this was the best thing that ever ever happened in sliced bread. Uh, sliced bread. And the funny part is, I said, and the cost because everybody looks at money, you know, like what it costs. I said, the money is whatever you want to give, and we give it, and that money will go to the security because you know they had stayed there for so many days in all these buildings and things like that overnight. For they couldn't go back to their homes as well due to the pandemic. So it's all if you start up things like this, which is there's a, it does good for the kids, helps the parents, and there's a give back. You know, then the circle works because then people don't feel that pressure, and that's how it gets bigger and bigger. That's actually quite incredible. In fact, you you, you know, speaking of the pandemic, uh, I mean, the, the Olympics this year are being held a year later because of COVID and you know, no spectators. Uh, and we've you know, we we've had the sort of unprecedented uh, uh, scene this year of you know, big athletes pulling out of events now. You know, saying that right. we're going to put our mental health first and we're going to focus on that. Whether it was Simone Biles or Naomi Osaka or Ben Stokes. Uh, you know, as an athlete, how do you feel about that? The fact that these conversations are taking place openly and, and you know, are athletes in a sense leading the way, leading by example, talking about things that I think many years ago people wouldn't be very comfortable saying in public. No, I'm so glad that they are because it is really a problem with uh, with with most people. I mean, so many of us suffer these things, like even like things like depression and all that comes in touch. But it's all a taboo, you know. It, it looks at like people think that they're sick or they're not well. But no, this could be something that and it can be cured, you know, with the right support, with the right parents, with the uh, parenting, with the right family, right friends. You, it's not something that's uh, uh, not curable. So the more we get our kids to talk about it, the more we spend time with them and explain to them, then that's how it's going to make the, the difference. I always tell every athlete, when they're at this game, at, when they're at the Olympic stage or they're the World Championship or even at national level, everybody's done the hard work. Everybody's made the sacrifices. Everybody's talented. So the only thing there now for winning and losing is the mental game. How strong are you mentally? How strong can you be? And that is so important, you know? So I think that's something that we have to also spend, uh, you know, uh, with our athletes to explain to them. I mean, a prime example would be something like the uh, hockey team, you know, four or five, you know, they were losing, but they never gave up. That's the mental strength comes in because stamina and uh, everything, everybody has. So it was really quite, quite uh, interesting that it is coming in. A few years ago, but people you know, wouldn't be but, but, you know, I mean, how do you, from an athlete's point of view, the fact that the Olympics have been held in this very sort of difficult uh, atmosphere, the circumstances are, are very difficult, yes. very unusual. And, you know, as I was speaking to Abhinav Bindra a few weeks ago on a different webinar, and he was talking about the mental stress that, you know, you all go through while right. training in any case. And this year has sort of added to that. So do you think it's really remarkable those who have managed to compete uh, you know, dis despite all the, the pressures of the pandemic around them. No, it's absolutely remarkable. Also, the other thing maybe which people don't realize is that when the Olympic Games were all set for last year, all athletes have peaked at that time. Then when you extend something by a whole year, they have to let themselves down because they cannot keep that peak performance the whole way as well. Mentally, physically, it doesn't work. So they had to let themselves down and then bring themselves back up again to this top form. So that makes it much harder much harder for these athletes and then we still got world records olympic records being broken so you can imagine what these athletes have gone through because that pressure of everything is ready and then it says no we've got to wait for another year it's like whoa yeah, yeah exactly exactly it's everything you worked for how do you yeah. look at india's performance in these games so far i think i think they've done a good job uh, they could have definitely done better. But, you know, as I say, you know, I don't look at medals. I look at the journeys. I look at these athletes that put on put such a good show. They fought hard. They've struggled for three, four years. So it's really uh, incredible, incredible to see. And what I loved about these Olympic Games more than any other is to see the amount of disciplines that we are in. You know, we are in fencing. We are equestrians come back after 21 years. We are in sports also sailing. the revival of hockey. The revival of hockey. At least revival people are in hockey, hockey again. Tablet. 
discus throwing you know we, we we never had any athletes you know in athletics and those things so it's, it's wonderful to see so many different different disciplines that we are we are shining so i think that's what made this olympics to me a little bit more special what did you think of uh, the the women's hockey team's performance today <laughs> uh, it's always uh, you know slightly yeah, hard but yes it is because they were you know Yes, but you know they gave their best. And that's what yeah. people have to realize when you're a sports person. There's so much pressure on them. There's so much pressure. But you know, it's the, that's what sport is all about. That's what sport is all about. You never, you know. If as a coach, when 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 you're mentoring uh, students in yeah. particular, do you tell them that the goal is to win, or that it's to do your best? always to do your best i say stay focused and make sure that whatever perform you have to be as close as you can to what you what you're performing at home because you're never better people have this wrong concept that you go to competition get better we actually get worse because there's nerves there's uh, stress mental and that's where the mental strength comes in so the closer you are to what you perform at home that's the, how how good you go to be at the game at at the event so finally imtiaz my question is that what what has riding taught you about life the good the bad the ugly if you had to you know sort of become a philosopher and, and put it up the one thing riding has taught me is that it's not all about yourself it's all about other people that make you make that have make your dreams possible so in life i always tell people be humble and look after the people that allow you to do what you what you're doing it starts with the horse and then your support team family coaches mentors friends it's all of them together and that's what riding has taught me that it's and that's why this book is so important because it really shows you the amount of people that made my dream come true and which horse are you riding right now so there was rajesh there was arizona who's there now so right now there's a horse called enrique he's also <laughs> owned by my uh, so we call him henry and he's actually owned by uh, the, my my main sponsor at the olympic games as well so it's for his granddaughter so i'm training him right now so that his granddaughter can compete okay wow so and enrique is is the new uh, the is, new. Is, is, yeah absolutely that's wonderful i just want to hold up the book for everyone to see once again riding free i really really think anyone who's in, not just interested in sport but just just go read it. it it's really really terrific very heartwarming and if you love animals believe me the bring some tears to your eyes as well so imtiaz anis you were such an inspiration thank you so much for this conversation and for this book and i wish you the very best uh, with your school and i hope you will inspire many more people to to enjoy riding and just enjoy the journey as you said thank you so much wow. for having me i really appreciate it wow me i mean you know, i was I wasn't sure whether I was the host here or an audience, or it was just such an engaging, exciting, mm -hmm. inspiring conversation. So, thank you, Imtiaz, and thank you, Nidhi, uh, for for sharing your thoughts and uh, really. So, I actually took a few uh, few sort of nuggets for me to ponder and think about, you know. And I'm going to what's going to stay with me uh, after today's conversation is. don't have negativity around you uh, and look after those who look after you you know uh, such such a powerful powerful message and i'm hoping that everyone who's listening to this uh, live and we have over 350 people uh, listening to this live and i'm sure this video is going to be on the knowledge factory channel and uh, i'm sure there are many many uh, who will listen to this later uh, but i think what i'm also taking away from what Uh, your book is all about intiaz and what you've uh, talked about today is that sports is not just another event you know and we all need to contribute to building that sporting culture which will just make us better people you know better citizens better uh, better uh, human kind you know and we have to support collectively fledgling sports people our children uh, make sports an integral part of our education and i'm hoping that Uh, this episode of knowledge factory and this knowledge uh, kf cafe is a step in that direction and we all have to create and support uh, you know uh, neighborhood champions uh, and that's how we will grow as a nation and most importantly take the initiative
uh, right? So uh, thank you so much. Really, really exciting conversation. And I just want to um, uh, mention Roshan Alexander from our team and Luan from our partner Virtue Blitz, who support us every time uh, and try and make sure that Knowledge Factory, which started as an offline event, uh, continues to have give the same experience to viewers and participants in the online version as well. Uh, we hope that we will continue to bring exciting people like Intiaz and Nidhi uh, to, to you again through KF Cafes and the main event. Uh, please subscribe to our channel uh, and um, please follow us. Thank you so much. And on behalf of Niti Consulting and the Promise Foundation, I wish everyone great luck and uh, keep sporting. Thank you so much for having us. Lovely to see you, Imtiaz. Bye. Bye.